This is The Competitive Edge with John Durant. Welcome to The Competitive Edge. My name is Scott Burton and I'm here to help you answer a question that we all have. How can I get an edge in my business and life? Each week we're going to uncover how some of the most successful and inspiring entrepreneurs, entertainers, and thought leaders get an edge so you too can reach your full potential. Do you want more unique ideas and tactics like the ones we're about to share in this episode? Then you're going to want to do two things. The first is to subscribe to the Competitive Edge on iTunes so that you don't miss out on new ideas from future conversations. After this, you're going to want to go check out my main site, lifelonglearner.com. When you enter in your email address to join the Lifelong Learner community, you'll get access to my most advanced strategies to stack the deck in your favor. Again, that's life longlearner Dot com. What's up, Competitive Edge listeners? If you're not living in a hole, you've probably heard about the Paleo Movement. Or maybe you've just seen dudes who look like the guy in the Geico commercial running around eating grass-fed beef in CrossFit shirts. Either way, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, that's cool because today's show is the Paleo episode. I've brought on my buddy, John Durant, author of the Paleo Manifesto, who's been called New York's caveman by the New York Times. I am so jealous of that title and John's awesome hair. John first got on my radar when I was working out of the co-working space General Assembly in New York City. I remember every day seeing this guy with an epic beard and long hair just standing there either reading or writing while we all pounded away at our keyboards. I soon got to know John and I think after the first time we chatted, maybe it was at a happy hour, He invited me to grab some venison steaks with him for lunch. I didn't know whether this was weird or really cool, but I was definitely intrigued and I started to really follow John's work. And as I got to learn more about paleo, about all the things he has on his site, huntergatherer.com, I really developed appreciation for his work and just the general philosophies that he preached for living a thriving and prosperous lifestyle. Because not only did I start to implement this stuff and see real results in my life. But all of this stuff is backed by science, which I absolutely love and gives me just a ton of confidence to follow what I'm reading. So today we're gonna unpack paleo, CrossFit, some cool stuff around intentional habit construction, and a whole lot more on how we can think about constructing a lifestyle that enhances our performance and emotional well being. I know when I first heard about all this paleo stuff, I thought it was just a fad, I was skeptical. But again, I started to implement stuff that John and other people in the field started teaching, and I just saw fantastic results. I felt better, I looked better, and I was performing at a higher level. And if you're listening to this show, I'm pretty sure that you want all of those things. So make sure to tune in. You're going to get a ton of great information, and John just knows this stuff better than anybody I've ever encountered. So let's go ahead and hear from John Durant, New York's caveman. John, what's going on, man? Hey, Scott, how are you? So good, so good. And I just came off uh, watching your interview with Stephen Colbert on YouTube. Man, you slayed that. I'm so happy I got to watch that. And I think you know one thing that we can do to really start this conversation off is is can you like demystify what paleo is? Because a lot of people they just see these CrossFit athletes running around, people eating grass fed beef. They hear the term, but they have no idea what it actually means. Yeah, the the goofy caricature is eating raw meat straight off the bone all the time, and the media often portrays it as people interested in historical reenactment or LARPing or something like that, which is (laughs) ridiculous. Um, I mean, the the simple way to think about it is just using evolution to understand human nature and human health, where we come from, how we evolved, and how we can use that information to be healthier in the lives we choose to lead today. And that can be diet. Uh, People hear about the paleo diet, but it can be all sorts of other areas of life um, from movement and exercise to having healthy kids and healthy babies to um, feeling motivated and having a sense of purpose in your life or being productive or all sorts of different things. I mean, if, if human nature plays a role 
in, in what you're interested in, well, then understanding our evolutionary past can help us make smarter decisions about it. And, and then in terms of diet specifically, because so many people are interested in that, uh, the, the, the concept's pretty simple. Um, all health authorities agree that in industrial processed foods aren't very good for you. So it's basically eating like we, we, we were before that, so when we were farmers um, in, in agricultural times. It, the paleo perspective just, just turns back, uh, it turns the page back uh, a little bit further and says, well, before we were farming and growing crops, we were hunter-gatherers in the wild. And that's for the Paleolithic, uh, about a 2.6 million year period when we were hunter-gatherers and foragers in Africa. And that's a long period of time, and it, and it left a pretty lasting mark on uh, the, the types of foods and the diet that uh, were, were better adapted to eat. So, so the idea is to use a Paleolithic diet as a starting point. Uh, the big difference there is uh, from, from other health authorities is grains and dairy. Uh, grains and dairy did not enter the human diet in any uh, large, significant quantity until the agricultural revolution 10,000 years ago or so. Um, and so if we're looking at some of the types of foods that are suspect for causing different health problems, um, that's a good place to start. doesn't mean that new foods can't be healthy. And it doesn't mean that everybody in the Paleolithic was perfectly healthy themselves. It's, it's, just a, it's just a heuristic, smart heuristic to think about what's probably healthy and what's probably not. So if we want to kind of just like condense this, Basically, humans have been living a certain certain way for a very, very long time, and modern culture has strayed away from those natural proclivities, and as a result, our health has our health has suffered. Yeah, yeah, and you know when when the agricultural revolution happened, um, when you when you sit down and start growing wheat all day long, and all you eat is is wheat and beer and a few other foods, health, uh, people got shorter. Uh, their teeth got worse. That's, their a, bone that's structure got so worse. crazy to me, man. As, especially because cavemen are so are usually typically characterized as like these short dudes with terrible teeth. But when I found out that they were actually taller, I mean, my mind was blown. Right, right. It, it, well, and and look, when you, everybody gets so hung up on on these issues when we think about human health, but if you take another species, if you take gorillas like I, like I did in my book, or, or if you take lions or whatever, if you go in the wild, I mean, <laughs> the, these are majestic, strong, powerful, sexy creatures. It, it doesn't mean they're perfectly healthy, doesn't mean they live forever, but they're well adapted to the lives, lives they lead. And the same is true of humans. So it's like, if you look, everybody knows that putting Shamu in a fish tank at SeaWorld is not good, right? It's, it's, it's unnatural. Thus, right. this animal is not going to be prosperous and thrive if they were in the Atlantic Ocean. Much along the same lines, if you look at the human lifespan, like some dude sitting at a desk eating mac and cheese uh, inside of an office building with no sunlight, it, humans are not going to thrive if they, tr if they behave the same way. Correct. And, and it's not just physical, it's mental too. I mean, it, everything, the brain's part of the body. So uh, it, it's not just obesity and diabetes and autoimmune conditions, autoimmune conditions have been shooting up like crazy. It's also depression and lack of motivation and anx chronic anxiety. I mean, these, we treat some of these mental issues as, as if they're a completely separate domain and go to psychiatrists and, you know, take these meds and things like that. A lot of people, the, this, the single simplest, most effective, um, least expensive thing they could do is get more sleep, get more sun, exercise, and eat a healthy diet. Amen, man. You know what's so funny to me? And I, I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant here. Rant away. I'm going to rant, dude. You know, we. I feel like in this modern society, you know, we both lived in New York. We both worked in General Assembly, a very entrepreneurial environment. Everybody's so focused on being successful and getting ahead and doing well professionally. They mm -hmm. sacrifice their diet, they sacrifice their fitness, they sacrifice their sleep, all of these things to be successful for what end? And I think the end at the end of the day is we all just wanna feel good, right? A high quality of life is one full of high quality emotions. And in the process, we cannibalize all of these things that are the most direct path to, to the end game. Right when we don't take yep. care of our health, we don't take care of our sleep, we don't take care of our diet. 
And it's just, oh man. I mean, I, I fight the urges too, but it's just so fascinating that that is how we behave. You know, it's it's easy to get caught in the rat race. There, there was a fascinating, uh, to, to just illustrate the the point you were making. There's a there's a fascinating study I believe that NASA did, of it was either astronauts or it was uh, polar explorers on on a base. I, I forget which one, but the the goal was to understand sleep in space. And and basically, if you let um, in situations where you don't have sunrise and sunset and people can set their own hours. Um, uh, the, the workers would often want to stay up a little bit later every night to try to just get an hour extra of work done, and then they would go get their seven hours of sleep or whatever. And, but here's the thing about that, is that if, if in the moment when you stay up that extra hour to, to do something, it feels like you're being more productive. But if you actually are sleeping the same number of hours every night, over the course of a month, you, you're not actually be spending more time working because these, these uh, astronauts would just wake up an hour later or be that much more tired. So there's this mirage where uh, we think that we're being more productive and getting work done, and there's actually something we could be doing that, uh, that is a lot more beneficial. Yeah, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but when we attune our sleep cycles to circadian rhythms, we we typically have more energy, right? Oh yeah, for sure. It, there's this weird. <laughs> our our country, our, the world has gone down the complete wrong path when it comes to energy. There's this idea that um, energy is something that you have to ingest, right? That it's in an energy drink or it's in an energy bar, right? Or it's um, and and it's something that you eat and digest, and suddenly it goes from what you eat and and you have more energy, but but. There, there are two of the best examples of things that make people energetic have nothing to do with eating anything. One is when the sun comes up, uh, you know, so if you're out camping and the sun comes up, oh, your, your body awakens and then you have more energy. That has nothing to do with eating anything. Or if there's a threat and you're being chased or, you've, um, you know, there's a violent altercation or something, suddenly your body floods with adrenaline and you feel very energetic. So what people, what, what we don't need is more energy. We have lots of energy in the form of fat. Uh, what people want is to feel energetic. And that's a very different thing than eating more or drinking more. Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes total sense. One of the things we were talking about prior to this was just like how habitat design can play into so much of this and really the psychology to making these changes. Where's, where's, where's the best place to get started to unpack that and think about that? Uh, where I started was I, I went to the Cleveland Zoo and uh, I had heard about this awesome experiment where they had changed the gorilla diet from a bunch of processed pet food bars, uh, fiber bars, to uh, something, a bunch of leafy vegetables more closely resembling what gorillas actually eat in the wild. Miracle of miracles, all these health problems went away. Um, <laughs> right? Surprise, surprise. Yeah. Um, but, but what you immediately realize when you're at a zoo, you're walking around from, you know, different little micro habitat to micro habitat is that the, when, when you make these an, when you try to make these animals healthy, you can't talk to them and say, Hey, you should, you should cut some weight or you should really exercise more. Right. <laughs> I just had the vision of just like calling a gorilla fat and it just like sitting there and doing nothing. Right. Yeah. Which is pretty much what humans do. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, and, and so what these zookeepers do, and the best ones in the world, if you go to the London Zoo or the Bronx Zoo or San Diego Zoo, uh, they change the habitat of the species to more closely resemble its natural habitat. And uh, our surroundings are incredibly influential on the decisions we make. There's, there's a famous set of studies showing that if you use large bowls and plates in your kitchen, you eat more. Um, it, there's uh, all sorts of studies showing that social, your social relationships and social network um, uh, has an influence on decisions like obesity or smoking. The, they almost look as if they're contagious conditions. Um, well, humans are social creatures and, and your, your social group is part of your habitat and has an influence on what you do. Um, 
if uh, you know, it, I I've lived with a lot of different types of roommates in New York, and I take on some of the habits of my roommates when I live with different people. Um, it might be what time you wake up or go to sleep. Um, you, I, you know, I guarantee you that if you start dating someone who's an early bird and you're a night owl, you're going to shift towards each other, towards each other. So, um, th this idea of, of habitat when, when applied to humans, isn't usually how we approach getting, you know, getting healthy. You're so usually, right, man. Gosh. Yeah. Usually it's, we, people make a new year's resolution. They say, I am going to be a different person this year. And they keep the same friends, the same family, the same job, the same bedroom, the same refrigerator, the same home, the same budget, the same everything. And, I, and there are so few people who can actually become a different person in the exact same circumstances. So, and, and then when they fail, they beat themselves up for it. So it's, it it's actually can be sort of liberating to be like, you know what? I need to change some things around me, and that will make it easier for me to be the person that I'd like to be. Dude, you're talking to the guy who moved out of New York City to Brazil to to, to be healthier and to, and to change his life. And I, I, I totally get it, man. And it's so funny because I, just the strategy we employ, as you alluded to, is never the is never the easiest one, the one of least resistance. Like for me, it's not hard if I... The, the perfect example comes that comes to mind is, is like I, I I was drinking a decent amount in New York City uh, due to my job, due to my social circles. Like I wasn't like getting white girl wasted constantly, but okay, Friday, Friday, Saturday night, drank maybe like the Thursday and the Wednesday I'll go out, like have two beers after work, whatever. And I moved to Brazil and like in New York, the idea of going out and not drinking was so foreign to me mm -hmm. like it was like wait people uh, look, nobody does that yeah and, and and it's like wait you're not gonna drink like people would look at me because i had seven heads and when i moved to brazil like none of my roommates drank and all of a sudden like for after one week like i didn't drink for three months i didn't have a single drink and it was the easiest thing ever yet like the you know the strategy for getting healthier losing weight whatever it is like is never change your friends Right. Right. And, I mean, and that's, you know, that's, that's tough to start thinking about people that way. Um, but, but, you know, there's, everybody's had someone in their life who, who can, can end up being a drag or we're sometimes those people ourselves and, you know, Debbie Downer sort of thing. Um, and it's real. I am so impressed though, by the way, that you did three months without alcohol. What, what changes did you notice specific changes to completely giving up alcohol? Um, like specific changes in how my body responded or changes yeah. that I made to do. Yeah. Like sleep quality, weight oh, loss. Stuff abso like that. Absolutely. I mean, I got in the, the best shape of my life. Um, my, I don't know, my body fat was lower than it's ever been. My sleep quality improved. I had less anxiety, uh, which was something that I, that I like now, like, oh no, duh, like alcohol causes anxiety, but uh, here I was like in a foreign country where I didn't speak the language, no job uh, besides working for myself, like all, all of these things that would be incredibly stressful to anybody, let alone like living in a city that was deemed like, you know, I don't know if you've seen city of God, but yep. <laughs> it's like, Rio, what are you doing, dude? Um, <laughs> and here I was, I was completely stress-free. Um, and that was something that would be very hard for me to emulate i believe if i was putting the things into my the toxins into my body that i was like i was while i was living in new york city yeah yeah i i feel that man and and there is a part of me that just wants to leave new york because everything here resolve revolves around hey let's get a drink hey let's get a drink and the dating scene everything it it i'm oh yeah it's wearing on me i hear you, you know what's you know what i you know, one of my buddies who's also on this podcast sebastian marshall do you know him I don't. Uh, really good guy. Um, he t he said something to me that just makes like so much sense, and and I'm I've been employing as I try to get healthier. But the idea is that you know, typically when we're unhealthy, where the failure point occurs is often in the planning stage, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's really hard for us to maintain the willpower if we like meet somebody at a bar and they order a drink and then you don't, then you don't like all of these situations 
put us in in str- very challenging situations to to uphold the protocol that we'd like to go ahead and enact. And what this means for me tactically is like, okay, well, instead of my like, let's grab a drink after work, like if I can just make that the default, like let's grab a juice, like let's grab a smoothie, let's grab a workout, let's grab a whatever, yeah. I can hopefully at least curb a little bit of those instances that I often find myself like having to like go like, am I going to be the guy who, you know, orders a seltzer water with lemon at the bar or not? Um, if, if you just cha- if you just are a better planner, yeah, it, it becomes easier to be healthy. I, I, I have a calendar thing every, every Sunday evening, it says, uh, schedule CrossFit classes for the week. And I'll, and I've just found that if I go and schedule them in advance, I'm much more likely to show up than if I just leave it up to my mood. Yeah, absolutely, man. I think, I think kind of CrossFit's a cool thing to talk about right now because for people that are listening, that are wanting to get healthier, CrossFit is a really a cool way to, to build that new circle of influence to, that makes changing your health habits much easier. Well, their breakthrough, people, you know, people get all hung up on the protocol. Is it 10 sets of three or three sets of 10? Or should we be doing Olympic lifting and things like that? That really misses the bigger picture here. The bigger picture is that CrossFit revolutionized the motivational habitat of the gym. If, if, you, if, if most people go into a standard sort of big box gym, um, there are actually only a limited ways limited ways to motivate yourself. Um, you're isolated from other people, um, usually, so you don't get to do any team related stuff. Which is, you know, most people grow up playing sports, and so doing something as a team or as a group is a good way to motivate people. Um, a lot of people are only measuring the amount of calories they burn, which is not a very deep source of motivation. Um, all the all the different workouts are excuse me, are these abstract motions, uh, bicep curls and bench press and things like that. And, and there's really no purpose to the motion. I mean, if, if you, you, you often, you, you hear about these, uh, uh, perhaps apocryphal, but stories of like a mother lifting a car off of her child or something like that, you know, after yeah. an accident or something like that. If you actually have a functional, real world objective staring you in the face, I guarantee you people exert greater effort and get better results uh, because it's meaningful. Um, and, and so the fact that these, these movements are pointless, they are literally pointless, um, is a big reason why a lot of people stop going to the gym. Totally. So, so that's, what I, that's what I love the most about CrossFit is, is really the, the motiv- motivation, the community, the sort of functional – inserting the functional uh, part back into fitness. Yeah. If your motivation is to look good at the beach, like that is eventually going to be subject to circumstances where the motivation wanes, right? Maybe you, maybe you get a, a partner that you don't really care about how you look at the beach anymore. Maybe it's winter. Maybe it's whatever. Maybe you just realize that, Hey, you know what? Like the number of curls I do and how many ripples in my abs actually really don't have that much of effect on the girls that I date at all. Um, and I know this firsthand, that's a, that's a losing strategy, fellas. Um, <laughs> right. so, so what I really love about it is this idea that it is, it is improving and enhancing our general preparedness for whatever life throws at us. And what's really cool about that is you're doing two things that, in the way that I think about it is a, you're increasing your capacity to better handle like any situation that could potentially put you or someone that you care about in harm. We talked like the example that we used, maybe you could talk about it um, right now about like essentially oh, like somebody you're... falling off a building. Yeah. There's like the classic uh, movie shot where somebody's dangling off the edge of a cliff or um, some off of the edge of a building and, and the hero has to, has to save the person. Ninety-nine percent of people in this country, if they were in that situation, they would be able to hold on for about two seconds, and they'd say, "Sorry, I didn't work out enough," and they'd have to you know, let the person fall to their death. Uh, there are some situations like that where they're highly unlikely that 
that you'll ever be in that situation. But holy shit, if I am in that situation, I do not want to live the rest of my life thinking, oh, I should have gone to the gym more. I could have right. saved my brother from falling off of the cliff. Or like, oh, I wish I would have done wrist rollers instead of bicep curls. Like, <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, my biceps are huge in the mirror, but my grip sucks. Um, or, or saving somebody from drowning, being able to, you know, be a strong enough athlete that you can dive into a body of water and carry something that weighs a hundred pounds to the surface. I mean, there are certain, there's, there are certain things that, uh, that, a that a human being should able, be able to accomplish if their life depends on it. Yeah. And I think too, like, the other thing that's really cool besides like, Hey, you do anybody who's seen like CrossFit athletes, like these guys are, people are ripped. Like people look great. Um, and, and yet the, they don't focus on that. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. I love that. And, and I think the other thing that's really cool too, is like this, the idea of prolonging, like your functional ability, uh, is really attractive. Right. So I've been in, really good, like quote unquote beach shape before, but like my back sore. And for some reason, like I, I play around a golf and like, I can't move. And I'm like, well, this, this, this doesn't add up. Like I look really good in the mirror and my swimsuit, but I can't do anything. Right. And I think what's cool about CrossFit is, is a lot of the exercises, they require certain levels of flexibility, reins of motion. They enhance muscles that, make those things easier to do and increase your work capacity. And what that means is, is like, if you do these exercises, you'll be able to increase. You specialize. Yeah. Yeah. You'll be able to increase your ability to do, to like live your life, do whatever you want for a longer period of time. Like I don't have to worry about not being able to snowboard when I'm 50 years old, fingers right. crossed, because I've been working on things that have like function that, I'm working on building my body in a way that allows it to endure a variety of things. Yeah, the, the the concept of general preparedness and sort of venerating Navy SEAL, sort of the all round all round generalist, is very cool. And look, you you go to these remote hunter gatherer tribes and indigenous people and things like that, and their their seventy year olds are carrying around buckets of water, they're walking around, they're lifting kids, they're bending over. They're not they're not in tons of arthritis pain and they're they're you know, they're not in a wheelchair or whatever because it, it, once once they hit that, it's kind of the end. Um but these they're they're spry um you, you're not seeing Alzheimer's, people are sharp um, all these different diseases of civilization are are relatively absent. So, um, and and I think we're realizing that as you know, as everybody's aging and people have put grandparents or parents into different types of nursing homes and they've seen Alzheimer's and and how that sometimes that last ten or even fifteen years of life can can be fairly low quality, and uh, I certainly want to avoid that. Yeah. And I think that really gets to the heart of like what the, you talk about in your book and why like paleo is more than just, you know, eating a, 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 a diet that doesn't have a ton of like starches and sugars and all of these things. It's, it's really about pursuing habits and a lifestyle that allows you to thrive and prosper for a long time, hopefully. Exactly. I, and I don't want to go live in the wild. I don't, I don't want to throw on a loincloth and, and go try to do that. I, I do enjoy civilization and technology and all that. So I, I sort of want the best of the old with the best of the new. Yeah, man, maybe it would be good for people that are listening. Cause I think there are probably some people right now that are like, might've started the episode, like gnawing on a piece of pizza sitting at their desk and are now like second guessing that. How did right. you transition from what we typically see in modern society from a health and wellness standpoint to where you are today? Like what were the, what were the, what were the things that, that catalyzed that? And then what steps did you start to take? Yeah. So, so my quick story is I had studied some evolutionary psychology in college and that had gotten me thinking in this uh, evolutionary perspective of, of there being a mismatch between how we evolved and how we live today. Um, but you know, I, I, I didn't actually take action in changing my health or diet uh, for years 
I had never been on a diet before. I never thought of myself as the type of person who went on diets. Um, I had put on another 20 pounds at my first desk job out of college, but it wasn't really a huge deal. You know, guys don't get judged on their looks as much, and 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 so it it wasn't as big of a deal. It was really my energy level spiking and crashing that really bothered me. Um, I came across this approach. It clicked with me. I said, oh, right, that's mimic what humans did in the wild. That's what you would do with other species, too. It ju- that's what I really like about it. This, this general way of thinking, or this way of thinking generalizes to other species. And then, um, you know, one day, I, I had been thinking about it for a couple months, and, and one day said, you know what, I'll just give it a shot for a month. And so I went whole hog, cleaned out my fridge, uh, went to the grocery store, bought a whole new set of foods. I told people that I was doing it and said I was going to be doing it for a month. So there was some set, you know, get some leverage on yourself. That's right. You got to commit publicly. Um, and I was, had a little blog where I was keeping daily notes of what I ate and any observations that I made. And I also had some other sources of enjoyment out of it. I, the consulting firm that I was at was, was pretty straight laced and, you know, everybody's sort of there wearing their blue shirt. Um, and this was a way for me to be a little bit different. I felt like I was getting an edge um, on other folks and, uh, and then just got terrific results over the first month. Um, and then the result, see, that's the benefit of going whole hog is it's easier to see big changes and observe them. And then those, those themselves can be a source of motivation going forward. Um, and, and, and so that's really how it started. Then I, then I got unanticipated benefits. I, um, yes, my energy evened out. I I dropped about 20 pounds of, of body fat. Um, my complexion improved a lot. I, this hadn't been a motivating factor for me so far, but I was frustrated that I was in my early twenties and I was still breaking out sometimes. Uh, my, my boss actually knew when I was really stressed out because I would get a huge pimple on the same spot of my nose every time. Wow. Um, which is embarrassing to say the least. And, you know, I, th- I thought acne was just this thing that people got in adolescence. Um, but it was, it, it continued. That went away. My skin got great. I went an entire winter without getting sick. I had always assumed that uh, you're supposed to get the cold, you know, the flu once and two colds every winter. And then suddenly I went one winter without getting sick at all. And it was like, it, it just, it, it really made me challenge some of my assumptions. Yeah. Um, that, so that, that's how I got going. And I think an important lesson here for people is like your desire and appetite for this diet did not build off of like some prescription without results. Like you were your own guinea pig to determine the efficacy of taking this approach with your life. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's changed over the years. I, I don't, I, I've continued to tweak things. I've continued to experiment and modify. And at the beginning, I wasn't paying any attention to fermented foods. And now I eat a ton of them and, um, and have paid more attention to gut health. You know, at, at the early days of paleo, people were sort of sh- shy about salt. And the more I've read about it and learned about it, and my own experience is I, I put sea salt to taste. Um, and, and I think that's healthy and good. Um, I've changed my attitude over on potatoes. There was, there's the great potato controversy of 2011. <laughs> which, it makes it sound like a, a the war thing. of 1812. Like. <laughs> it was a real thing. I think I'm joking. Nope. Um, and there have been battles over sort of low carb and moderate carbohydrate, and I've tweaked all of those things. So um, I re- in the book, I really encourage people to start with an orthodox paleo approach for the first month. And then... I sort of show them some different ways that they can tweak it to customize it for, for their own tastes and preferences and injuries and allergies and genetic background and ethnic and cultural background and gut bacteria and allergies and injuries and all sorts of those things. Yeah, and I think that's the important thing for people to realize is like I, I've been getting increasingly interested in epigenetics and the fact is is like we are all unique in in how our bodies react to certain things and so we cannot, we can use these templates and prescriptions as a base and starting point, but we must calibrate with how we feel and what we decide and how we ex- experiment uh, in order to get the best results. There's not going to be 
just one bulletproof approach that works for everybody. And that's the complete optim best way to optimize your health. Like you, you unfortunately you have to test. Yep. There's no way around it. So we, we kind of got started talking a little bit prior to this call. I mentioned, uh, I called my buddy, Chris, who's a mutual friend and had told me to ask you about all the stuff going on with skin microbiomes. And I'm still a little unfamiliar, but I know that you're excited about it. So yeah. maybe we could dig into that a little bit. So first of all, I love microorganisms. It is one of the coolest areas of health these days, both in terms of gut health and gut bacteria um, and bacteria that's on our, on our skin, the skin microbiome. The, uh, the gut and the skin are the two largest sources of exposure to the outside world. These are the parts of our body that come in contact with other things. And so actually the gut and the skin are very important uh, parts of our immune system. And microorganisms on the skin and in the gut play a really, really important role, um, not just in things like digestion, but in our actual immune function. Um, so l let me tell you first about the gut because more people have heard about uh, gut bacteria and, and so then I want to draw some parallels to the skin stuff. Um, what we're realizing again is that uh, these uh, beneficial bacteria in our stomach are sort of our first line of defense and, uh, and they respond really quickly to the types of foods that we eat and alterations that we make to our diet and what we drink and things like that. Um, and we've depleted our gut bacteria with antibiotics and alcohol and eating uh, diets heavy and refined carbohydrate and not eating fermented live culture fermented foods anymore. So we've really done a number on our stomach and what we're seeing is a huge explosion in autoimmune conditions, um, which many of which originate in the gut. Um, can you describe, like, can you like put that in layman's? So like an autoimmune condition, that's like an example of that. Uh, peanut allergies. Got it. Um, or irritable bowel syndrome or uh, Crohn's disease. Um, these are, uh, the, the general mechanism that appears to be happening is that we destroy our gut bacteria and then we irritate um, the lining of our stomach. Um, which in, So there's inflammation and after a certain point in time, the, the barrier between our gut and the rest of the body actually breaks down and certain molecules and proteins leak into our bloodstream and then the immune system recognizes them or identifies them as invaders and then attacks. So there seems to be something going on in kids these days where their gut bacteria and their stomachs are damaged at a very young age and for example uh, some of the proteins in peanuts appear to be getting through and trigger a huge autoimmune response and then if, if it happens in sort of the, a certain way then that person has a peanut allergy for the rest of their life. Um, a lot of autoimmune conditions seem to uh, get initiated through this general path. Interesting. Um, so, so that's that area. So I, I had been dabbling in gut microbiome stuff for years and really cool stuff and I've seen effects on my own health and then there was this awesome article in the New York Times at the end of May called my soap-free, shampoo-free, bacteria-rich hygiene experiment. Um, I don't know if you saw it or not. It got passed I, I, around. I haven't. I'd love to, he I'd love to hear about it. Um, it basically, it, a reporter uh, for the Times Magazine did an experiment where for 30 days she stopped using skincare products and used a spray that contained good bacteria uh, created by a company called AO Biome. Uh, they're up in Cambridge, Massachusetts and I'm, I'm actually now an advisor to the company. Um, and it, people should go read it to hear all of her experiences. Um, there was a lot of stuff she liked. There was a couple things she didn't like. Um, the, but she found that her skin quality improved, that when she had her period, she usually had acne in the past, and, this, and, and now she didn't. Um, a huge reduction in odor, um, even though she wasn't using deodorant or things like that. Um, dry skin going away, things, things like that. And so what this company has figured out is that there's, there's 
what appears to be a very important class of bacteria called ammonia oxidizing bacteria or AOB, hence, hence the company name, AOBiome. And this class of bacteria feeds on ammonia um, and ammonia is uh, in our sweat, it's in our feces and, and so it, it actually converts ammonia into what's called nitrite and nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is, which then gets, the nitric oxide then gets reabsorbed, or much of it does, uh, by the body. Nitric oxide is a really important molecule um, in, in the body. It's, it, it has two primary roles, um, or two main roles. Uh, first, as a vasodilate, vasodilator, or re relaxing blood vessels. The, the nitric oxide channel is how, like, Viagra uh, works, or a lot of hypertension uh, blood pressure drugs work. Um, and then as a signaling molecule. Uh, so nitric oxide is this really important, um, is this really important molecule in the body. And it appears that, uh, it seems probable that, that the, the bacteria on our skin, it used to be the main source of this. But here's the thing is that this good bacteria is easily destroyed by all sorts of different ingredients that are in our skincare products. Um, there's a category of ingredients called surfactants uh, that are extremely damaging to them. And this class of bacteria grows very slowly. So, so most types of bacteria sort of double every 20 to 30 minutes. This class of bacteria doubles every, I think it's 10 to 14 hours or something like that. So you know, it, it requires a few doublings. If you've almost wiped something out, it requires a, f you know, five, six doublings to, to recover in a, in a big way. And, but that takes too long. And, and these, uh, these AOBs never get a chance to recover, uh, because we've wiped them out with soap and shampoo and lotions and deodorants and sprays and perfumes and all these different things. So, um, there is a strong case to be made that a huge host of skin conditions, including many autoimmune conditions, um, may be caused by inadvertently destroying our skin microbiome. Hmm. And our skin is covered in bacteria, but we've become so obsessed with hygiene and use such strong measures, such strong soaps and things like that, that um, Yes, we're getting rid of the bad bacteria, but we're also get rid of, getting rid of the good bacteria. Man, you're making me second guess whether I should go buy some more cleaning clear today. <laughs> right. So, so here's all right. So, I've I've been doing a little experiment with this stuff. I have this spray from from AO Biome. It's called Mist, um, and it just it comes in a spray bottle. I so I, I shower every day, but I've really I've basically cut cut out soap. Um, if if there's really a situation where you know I think it needs it, I'll 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 do some soap, but I but I usually don't. Is that shampoo as well? Include shampoo. With so they they're working on um, so this spray. I'll do after the shower. They are working on developing a uh, a biome friendly soap and shampoo. Uh, but they haven't released it yet. It'll probably be out before the holiday season this year. I was more curious about, do you use shampoo personally? Because I, you have some amazing locks of hair. <laughs> you know how to get straight to my heart. I, I, um, I, I'm jealous, man. The, and you know, when I, what happens with me is when my hair is long, it, it just gets greasy. Um, yeah. Which is the whole, you know, where, where the shampoo comes into play for me at least. Yeah. I, I do. I do use shampoo. I, I shampoo about every three to five days, sort of depending, um, we, which is pretty typical among women with longer hairs is they rarely shampoo it every day. Um, but then it does get too greasy. I did an experiment when I was writing my book and was completely reclusive and in my cave where I, I tried to go completely shampooless and I did it for about three weeks and it just wasn't degreasing for me. Mm. So I cut it short, but I started using this stuff, this spray and it, 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 it basically eliminates, it eliminates my odor. 
Uh, so I will I will spray it after I'll do it in in the morning after a shower. I'll do it at night before I go to bed. I'll spray armpits, crotch, face, chest, and then just sort of anything. Um, and I I just went through a New York summer, and I and I swear to God, I, I've had the girlfriend check on this. I've had you know female approval. It remove it got rid of odor. So my next question is, that's awesome, by the way. My next question is, so people might be listening to this and go, okay, cool, but so does my Old Spice Pure Sport and why should I be using this spray? Right, well, so a few things. One is, a lot of people are realizing that the way that these antiperspirants work, deodorants and antiperspirants, is uh, through clogging your pores with aluminum. Um, and more people are realizing, oh, maybe I shouldn't be uh, sticking a you know a metallic compound in into my pores. Maybe there's some drawbacks to this. Um, the second thing is, a lot of people actually would like to improve their skin quality and have either persistent dry skin or acne or eczema um, or uh, feet that continually smell no matter what you put on them or socks or shoes that really smell or a fungal issue or jock itch, um, uh, things like that. So dandruff, dry scalp. So, like It'd be one thing if most people had pretty good skin uh, using these products, but the reality is a lot of people are persistently treating skin problems all the time. Um, and uh, the the company it, it's what's exciting is a lot of people have been um, who have tried a lot of different skincare products have have gotten some near miraculous results with it so it's uh it's exciting yeah it, it, you know I always think about like trying to address the source instead of like putting a band aid on something right and it sounds like this company is approaching skincare exactly that way which is pretty cool yeah well and it um. The other thing that's cool about it is that when you create, see, see, bag, the the microbiome, whether it's the gut or our skin, it's really about creating the right ecosystem. Some strains may be more important than others, but really, you want to create the right sort of balance so that everything it's in equilibrium and everything sort of does what it's supposed to do. Um, and we don't understand whether it's the gut or the skin. We don't understand what that ecosystem is yet. The, we're we're just sort of at the beginning of of understanding how this works, um, but we know it's really important, and that when you do have the right ecosystem, it's much harder for pathogenic bacteria and viruses to infect you. And so, the, you know, they've they've found with this particular product that it kills MRSA, the antibiotic resistant um, uh, strain of bacteria that's causing a lot of problems and. Uh, hospitals and other other parts of the world and things like that, um, and and we'll find that with the gut too is that when you have a healthy stomach, uh, people are going to be less likely to get food poisoning or um, other illnesses and things like that. So it's it's not just about hey I don't smell or whatever. It's it's almost like microorganisms as this first line of defense. It's almost like a coat of armor. Um, or a shield or a defense against uh, pathogenic microbes. Yeah, and I'm I'm actually really fascinated too how this these microbiomes in the gut might affect our cognitive abilities because I oh, keep yeah. I keep reading up about how like the gut is essentially our second brain and anything that enhances my cognitive and performance like I want to know about and try. It, it, they there was a paper that came out earlier this year. Uh, that showed a, a strong association between uh, kids with autism and uh, a narrower spectrum of good bacteria in their in their gut. Doesn't mean it's causation, um, but th there is a ton of evidence connecting uh, the gut and the brain. And my my personal experience with this <laughs> revolves around alcohol. Nice. Um, <laughs> It has become a ritual for me after a night of heavy drinking to drink kombucha. And I, I, this is not like a hippy-dippy thing. Same with this, 
this skin spray. I'm not doing this because I, yeah, I want to feel one with nature and my earthy, you know, hippie, whatever. I'm in it for optimal performance. And I know that when I have a kombucha after a night of heavy drinking, I can feel my mood improve. I, I can just, mm. I can feel my mood improve. I, I can't, you know, maybe it's a placebo. It works for me. Is now is that because there's some bacteria that are in that particular drink? Because all I know about kombucha is that it's it's delicious. A there's a little bit of alcohol in it, and isn't it a, isn't it like a type of tea? It so it's fermented tea, and it has live uh, cultures in it, um, and I forget which one or which ones. Um, and there are some that actually have. There's some that are labeled as having a you know a, a decent wa a decent bit of alcohol in it. Many of them don't for all intents and purposes. Um, but it it's just a it's just a a fermented food that uh, that you can drink and get some good bacteria. Watch like two days after this episode, like college campuses are like rampant with kombucha. <laughs> <laughs> These kids are trying to fight their hangovers. Yeah, you know it's uh, one thing I'm curious to ask you about and. A lot of people, they see all of this like earthy whole foods, kombucha, and they're probably like, all right, like I'm, I'm not a wussy. Like I don't need that stuff. I don't need to, I don't need to like go on a diet and all this stuff. And I think like a lot of young males at least have just like misconstrued what it means to be masculine and how all of this performance stuff really fits in. And I'd be curious to hear like what your reaction is to some of those types of statements that you probably hear a lot, quite frankly. Yeah. I, I mean, I experienced it myself because I didn't see myself as the type of person who would go on a diet. Uh, that's one of the reasons why you will not see the word diet on the cover of my book, because uh, I actually don't view it as a diet um, and, and what I do. Um, yeah, you know, barefoot running, you know, there goes the hippie, the long-haired hippie and, and, and things like that. But at the same time, you go into a CrossFit box and you're working out with uh, ex-Navy SEALs and uh, first responders and, and, and folks like that. And uh, part, part of the appeal of, of paleo, quite frankly, is that when I looked at a lot of the existing options in the, in the health space, there seemed to be a persistent disapproval of eating meat or red meat. Um, and I thought that was likely to be incorrect, both for evolutionary reasons um, and on a personal level, I do enjoy uh, eating meat. Um, I, it's a good, healthy source of protein for building muscle and stuff like that. So, um, you know, I, I think what, what paleo and CrossFit and some of more the, the evolutionary approach has done is it, it actually has created a little bit more of a masculine identity for in, in the health space because if you think of say vegetarianism and yoga definitely have like a feminine vibe to them I, I yoga is good I, I think everybody could benefit from increased flexibility but it, it's it's it, it definitely has a feminine vibe um, Whereas CrossFit, particularly in the early days, has a masculine vibe. Um, and, and it's funny because when, then you look at the diets where paleo gets characterized as meat heavy and vegetarianism is, is without meat. And it's almost like our hunter and gatherer personas and histories are now manifest in these different ways of living. And you have the hunter male and then you have the gatherer female that's more plant-based and it, it's almost like they've they've are are still hanging around with us even millions of years later. Yeah, you know what's really weird <laughs> is that I just started. Uh, I recently um, was like dating this like yoga chick for the first time, who's all like yoga vegetarian, like the whole nine. Like if it was like if it was like societally characterized as female like in the health and fitness thing, like she was into it. Right. And it was like, there was this like magnetic attraction between us. And I, I, I am very much of like all the other things. Like I, I do the paleo, I do CrossFit. I do like all of these, like, I don't know. Like if it's, 
if it's masculine, I'm interested in learning about it. <laughs> right. And and it's just I, I do wonder, like, is that residue like is all this residue from the hunter gatherer evolutionary biology that like we are naturally wired to feel certain ways about certain things we can't even explain it? I I, I think so. The the look this is a hot topic these days, but there are differences between men and women that are very deeply rooted. It doesn't mean that people don't have the flexibility to, you know, carve their own way these days, and that's good. Um, but at the same time, biological sex isn't going away. And, and, and so I think it manifests itself. I think it definitely does. I think it's extremely powerful, too. And, and we need both. I mean, that's one of the one of the themes that I come back to near the end of the book, I have a chapter called Hunter and a chapter called Gatherer, and um, we need hunters. We need people out there engaging with the ecosystem and uh, hunting and, and, and getting their hands dirty um, in, in the wild. And, and we, also need, we, we also need the other essence, the, the gatherers and the vegetarians and the plant-based world and, and people that will bring to light abuses in the factory farm system and things like that. So um, I think going forward, we, we, can, we can draw a lot sort of from, from both yin and yang. Absolutely, man. The, la the last thing I want to ask you is, is like, where do you see a lot of people see a diet like paleo, they see a movement like CrossFit, like, oh, that's a fad, like, or that's something just like the Atkins diet that'll eventually disappear or the juice cleanse or whatever. What do you see as like, where, what do you see as the future of the integration of these principles? Like, are these here to stay? Are they going to yeah. continue to grow? I'm curious just to hear. Yeah, you. I, I think they're here to stay. They They'll probably change and adapt um, as, as we learn more, modify these approaches. There are a few reasons why why I think paleo is here to stay. Um, one is a practical reason, which is there are a lot of people who have started eating paleo because they have a specific functional issue like irritable bowel syndrome or Crohn's or some other autoimmune condition, and they find that it addresses their problem. And if somebody has had IBS for almost their entire life and ha has had to stay within 50 yards of a toilet at all times and they change how they eat and four days later most of their symptoms go away or all of them, those people aren't going back. So first of all, a lot of people who, who have gone paleo, it's, it's not just about weight loss, it's, it's about other sometimes more intractable problems. Um, a second thing is you, you do see uh, this lifestyle component, whether it's uh, the tie-in with CrossFit, um, the tie-in to other ways of, of living and people viewing it as a lifestyle, just like people use view ve vegetarianism as a lifestyle. And, and lifestyles tend to stick around. They, you know, they might not take over everything, um, but they don't go away. Um, and, and then the third thing is, look, if this approach really is as grounded in science and our evolutionary past as, as I think it is, and, and, and many other people do too as well, um, as new findings are discovered a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now, um, it, it, paleo will be, continue to be in the conversation, whether the new findings contradict or support it, and even if you know some of some of the principles evolve, then good. Then it should adapt, and yeah. it should change, and it should integrate new information if something was wrong. So, so that's that's actually why I'm optimistic that that it'll it'll hang around. Yeah, and I think you know, although I haven't been as diligently following it as much as you have, I'm sure. Like from what I perceive, like leaders like yourself, like Rob Wolf, when new research comes back that is scientifically backed. Like there is an adaptive culture. Yeah, abs absolutely. It, it, and it's, a, it's adaptive in two directions. It's adaptive towards uh, expert science. So if, if good scientific evidence comes down the pike and, and gets published, and it's adapted towards from, uh, to, to personal experience and biohacking and experimentation. And, and if, if people can be, uh, adopt sort of an open source mindset um, in that regard, uh, you know, it's, it's a good way to make progress. Absolutely. 
John, this has been fantastic, dude. I thank you so much for just taking the time to educate us about the paleo movement. If people want to read your fantastic book that I just finished reading prior to this interview, where's the where's the best place for them to get their hands on that and learn more about you? Yeah, uh, the book's on Amazon. It's called The Paleo Manifesto. And I should warn you, it's not a diet book. Uh, if you just want a list of foods of what to eat or what not to eat, uh, th there's some other better diet books out there for you. This is more of uh, an intelligent and fun and entertaining uh, uh, journey um, into, into our evolutionary past. Um, so, so you can go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble and, and find it there. And then my website is huntergatherer.com and you can find me on Twitter at John Durant. Awesome, man. You have the best domain ever. And by the way, <laughs> I want to give you props. When you sent me an email before this and it said sent from cave phone, I lost it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's my brand. Yeah. It's, it's all encompassing. No, well, so. well done, man. Well, thanks again. Thank you for having me on. That was a blast. Absolutely. Before we finish up with today's Mindshare, I just want to say thanks for listening to another episode of The Competitive Edge. If you enjoyed the ideas in this episode and want access to future conversations, the best thing you can do is subscribe to The Competitive Edge on iTunes. If you haven't done that already, right now is the best time to take care of that and get on board. And while you're there, if you feel like this show has made a positive impact on your day, it'd be great if you could leave us an iTunes review so that more people can find the show. Now, I know we covered a lot in this episode, and there might be a few key ideas or tools that you want to remember. So we went ahead and compiled all of the notes and links mentioned from this conversation for you on lifelonglearner.com. That's life-longlearner.com. Alrighty, let's go ahead and dive into today's Mindshare. Alrighty, Competitive Edge listeners, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with John Durant. The dude's a total stud. And today I thought I could talk a little bit more about CrossFit because this past weekend, I actually just got my CrossFit Level 1 certification, which is pretty cool. It means that basically I can coach people in CrossFit. And a lot of things came out of this weekend that I didn't anticipate. Truthfully, uh, I wanted to get the CrossFit certification because I wanted to learn more about it. I wanted to start potentially training people because I really think it's awesome. And I just ended up learning a ton of really cool things about how to think about health and the human body and fitness that I think would be really valuable for a lot of people to listen to out there. So before I got into this stuff, uh, I was definitely into heavy lifting, a lot of strength training. I'd go to 24 hour fitness you know, what Equinox, New York Sports Club, all that stuff, lift like three to five times a week. And it was great and it was awesome. I think what I didn't really realize though was like the difference in what I was optimizing for. Truth be told, uh, I really just strength chained because I wanted to look good, I wanted to be strong. And I knew that at the endocrine level, the lifting of heavy weight is very good for uh, hormonal stuff. That's That's why I did it. What I think this type of workout misses out on and even a lot of things like the treadmill and all these other things is it isn't very functional. And for me, like for my life, uh, I want to be able to snowboard. I want to be able to play baseball with my kids. I want to be able to do all the things I want to do for as long of time as possible. And what's really cool about CrossFit is that it is not necessarily geared towards building the biggest biceps or the fastest mile or any of these very specialized skills. What it really is geared toward is your ability or, or capacity to basically just be athletic, to move large loads over different time and modal domains, which means that whether I'm snowboarding or whether I'm deciding I want to go for a run or play hoops or whatever it is, like this type of training is preparing me for all of these different things. And the way that they do that is through varied functional training that's that's constantly varied. So you don't know what the workout is, executed at high intensity. And why that why I really like this is because you know, I don't I don't know what 
my life is going to throw at me. Like, I don't know what's coming my way. I don't know what I want, what hobbies I want to be having in the next five, 10 years, but it's cool because I can prepare for those and I can, I can build this really solid foundation. And I think one of the problems with traditional strength training is, is that like, I was so tight and inflexible that even though I was really strong and my physique looked good, I wasn't just able to do a lot of the things that I really wanted to. And so many of the movements within CrossFit that you'll do at the gyms, it requires you to have a certain level of mobility and flexibility. And over the course of my life, it's a really good thing to be building that flexibility and mobility so that I can move around and move freely and vigorously you know, not only when I'm 25 and I'm just have age on my side, but when I'm older, when I, when I have a family, when I'm, you know, less, I guess like less naturally prone to be able to do things. So, you know, you're building strength, you're building stamina, you're building endurance, coordination, agility, all of these things that really just help optimize your ability to do things over the entire course of your life. And that's super attractive. And what's also really cool is that you have a venue to compete with yourself. Now, I, unlike most people, a lot of people log their weights, a lot of people don't, but literally if you go to a CrossFit gym, you have somebody else measuring your times and rep counts for you. So if you're one of these lazy people that does not keep a log book and doesn't track their workouts, thus can't push yourself to a threshold where you're constantly improving systematically, that's really built in for you. Because somebody else is constantly clocking your times and it's really just a great way to just compete against yourself constantly. And although the workouts are highly varied, typically there is a benchmark workout like every week or every couple of weeks that allows you to see if you're improving against your previous time. So if you're looking to really satiate that competitive desire, it's awesome. And there's also a community. I think unfortunately, and this is a problem that I'm looking at solving to be totally candid. Unfortunately, the gym has become a very... Uh, just uncomfortable, like very Spartan place socially where people don't really interact. And when you're going through these trials and, and personal and mental wars to get through the workout with other people, you're going to build relationships there and they're going to be strong. So maybe if you're looking for a group of people that can help you get healthier, if you're looking just for some new friend groups, you can get that at the gym uh, with this type of workout. And it's much easier than going up to people at 24 hour fitness and being like, Hey, done with that dumbbell. Oh, by the way, I'm Scott. Uh, we all know that we've done that to try to talk to people that we find attractive and you know, that doesn't usually go very far. So just wanted to get some cool thoughts on this, uh, in people's lives. It's definitely been, these gyms are expensive, but what's a better investment than your health? Like seriously, going out to dinner with friends, getting drunk with your friends on the weekends, like some new toy. None of that is as important as spending money on your health that's going to contribute to you, how you feel every single day and your longevity. Uh, I just don't think there's a better investment that you can put your money towards. So that's my two cents. Uh, if you're interested in CrossFit, definitely check out CrossFit.com. You can probably find a gym on Google Maps, or something close to your house. And I encourage you to give it a try. It's definitely yielding dividends in my life. Alrighty, I will see you next time. Thanks again for tuning in today.